Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for another episode of the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds. Today, we take up one of the more public data breaches that uh, we've heard of in the last two weeks, the MGM Grand Breach in Las Vegas. Matt, first of all, welcome. Hello, Tom. Good to be here. Uh, Matt, I can't think of a more public way to have a data breach than uh, one of Las Vegas' biggest casino companies. It literally went from the um, floor room to the boardroom. So you want to set the stage for us? Sure. So this involves uh, MGM Resorts. And just to make it even worse, Tom, it's not just one of the biggest casinos in Las Vegas. It was all of MGM's casinos all over the country. Uh, They suffered a massive cyber attack. uh, And the MGM and the Bellagio in Vegas were the two flagship resorts of the MGM brand. Uh, But there were uh, casinos, at least I think a dozen of them all over the United States that got caught up in this cyber attack where uh, guests were locked out of their rooms. If you had those digital keys on your cell phone, that didn't work. Uh, Online registration, that didn't work. Uh, MGM's website and uh, mobile apps, they didn't work. As of right now, Tom, I just checked before I got on here. MGM's website is up. Uh, It's mobile app on my phone because I was there the other month. That still doesn't work. Um, The slot machines didn't work. The ATMs didn't work. The cashier desks where you could cash in your poker chips for cash, they had to close. Uh, The food and beverage, if you wanted to place an order online uh, and then have it billed to your room, that didn't work. Total mess. And it lasted for uh, at least now, I think, more than a week. Uh, the worst of it lasted for days and days. I think it originally started last Sunday, September 10th, and was still very disrupted well into the end of last week. Like I said, we've got mixed results now here about what is or isn't functioning at various uh, MGM resorts. I'm still not quite sure they've fully resolved this. Uh, for a long time last week, they had to uh, admit guests by using paper and pen at the reception desk writing down credit card numbers on slips of paper and, you know, placing food orders, um, I guess, over the phone or through waitresses or whatnot. Um, We believe this happened through a hacking group that used a social engineering attack to dupe the MGM help desk into giving away valuable credentials they should not have given away. Um, We can talk much more about all of this, but clearly it is a huge cyber attack is going to cost MGM, I don't know how much, uh, millions, I would suspect, if not potentially uh, tens of millions. And then, Tom, to top it all off, I don't know if you saw this, once we get to potential regulatory issues, one of the victims who was at MGM, who could not check into her room, was the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, who wound up having to write down her personal data on a scrap of paper to be able to check into the hotel because of a data breach. I would not wish that on the worst CISO enemy I could ever have is to have your, the head of the FTC caught in your data breach. This is gonna be a very painful episode for MGM for a long time. Short of Gary Gensler, I can't think of uh, anyone less that I would want, uh, particularly Ms. Khan, but you, you touched on several different points there, Matt, but there are actually multiple lessons from this. Oh, uh, yes. Currently, corporations do not have to disclose. Uh, they will uh, starting January 1. Uh, but could you walk us through what might be some of the decision-making calculus uh, if such a rule was in effect and how companies or corporations should begin to think through whether this was a disclosable event? Well, I I had a lot of thoughts about that because you're right, Tom, just the other month, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, adopted a rule that you will now, as a public company that suffers a material cybersecurity event, you would need to disclose that fact in a Form 8K within four days of deciding that, yes, this event is material. Now, you are correct. This will not go into effect until the end of the year. So what happened at MGM is not subject to these disclosure rules. On the other hand, you could either say, who cares because the whole world knows about it. It's just, it's been disclosed whether you like it or not, MGM. So you might as well get ahead of it. 
Uh, or we could conduct a thought experiment just for the sake of it, which is where I had started with my analysis. If these rules had been in effect, what would MGM have had to do? And so I think that, you know, you could do sort of a mathematical approach to this. Is this a quantitatively material cybersecurity event? And you could look at something like how much revenue do we make as a company? Uh, are we losing revenue because of a ransomware attack? Uh, let's remember, if you suffer a privacy breach of stolen data, that doesn't actually disrupt your operations. It's going to be additional expense sometime down the road, but it's not like you can no longer process sales because you had a data breach. Um, that's not what happened with MGM. What happened was a ransomware attack where they couldn't process their operations because all of their operations were shut down by the ransomware attackers. Um, so how much money were you losing per hour? And at what point would you then have a material amount of revenue that's not coming in the door? Or at what point would you have a material amount of cost that is piling up that you would then be able to say quantitatively, this is material? You could do some back of the envelope um, calculations. I did some of that with MGM. You know, for example, MGM last year had 5.73 billion in casino revenue. Um, that doesn't include food and beverage. It doesn't include online gambling or anything. It includes like the stuff that happens on the floor of the casino, 5.7 billion in revenue. Well, if you set materiality at a 1.5%, which seems like a reasonable amount to me, then if you lose 86 million in casino revenue, that would be material. And if you do the math, 5.73 billion over the course of 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you would hit that 1.5%, 86 million in materiality. You would hit that in about five and a half days. So I suspect just on quantitative grounds alone, you could say MGM has a material breach and it would have to disclose it four days after making that calculation, which would mean you'd probably have to disclose it sometime right around now because we're four days after that. But those are the kind of calculations that a company might have to do. I've grossly oversimplified the math, and I know that. But if you're looking quantitatively, you would need to think through what are our key systems that bring revenue in? What are the key disruptions that would impose additional costs? How do we actually track costs or revenue lost per hour? And you know, at what point would we know we have now suffered a quantitatively material item? that we have to put into the 8K. Um, because if it's just math, you can't really argue that, no, it's not quantitatively material. If it's just math, anybody could point it out and figure it out and say, yes, it was. Anybody, including the Securities and Exchange Commission, who would say, yeah, you knew it was material by then. You should have disclosed it within four days later. Instead, we got it two days before the end of the period closed or something like that. Those are the sort of tricky issues we're going to have. But Tom, I'm more interested in thoughts about, is it a qualitatively material cybersecurity event? Where I mean that, does the nature of the breach imply something so off about your cybersecurity regime that you have to disclose that even if you haven't lost 50 cents? And I think that's where the MGM case gets interesting because we do have a lot of questions about how this happened but they're not going to be the only ones who go through this. So everybody listening, you would need to think through what would a qualitatively material cyber incident look like at my company? How would we identify that? And are, you know, are we clear on it? Or do we have a consensus in our company about what a qualitative material item is? Because if you don't, and the SEC thinks you do, then suddenly you could be looking at an enforcement action and it could get very messy. So an appreciation of what is a qualitatively material factor in cyber, I think is going to become the, one of those things that it becomes more important to get right in the future now that we have these new rules. How do we put some parameters around what might be a qualitative event? Is it a company that deals with consumers, a company that deals very much in the public eye? Is it all of the above, none of the above? Or I mean, it could be. that. That's the problem with qualitative materiality is that it's something, what's the Supreme Court's definition? Uh, you know, it's material when it adds to the total mix of information a reasonable investor would find useful. Like, 
what does that mean? I, this is a terribly subjective standard, but I think that's the point about qualitative materiality. You have to know it when you see it, and people might have different views on what they're actually seeing there. But certainly, would it be qualitatively material if you know it is the latest in a series of breaches you have suffered in the same manner? Um, you know, for example, if you have suffered a privacy breach because of a phishing attack, but this is the fourth time your employees have fallen for a phishing attack in two years, does that mean that you have a qualitatively bad cybersecurity training program? Um, and auditors struggle with this because they don't really know. But we mentioned Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission before. The FTC has specifically taken enforcement action on that point against other companies. So it's not Securities and Exchange Commission. I get it that they work on a slightly different theory of what is or isn't the FTC's business to enforce. But the FTC has called companies out. And so is the New York Department of Financial Services, now that I think about it, where you, know, you company have had this failure happen three or four times before. Clearly, you have a problem with your control environment, and that is a qualitative statement about your cybersecurity. Here is your painful enforcement action, complete with fine. That has happened, and I think that the SEC is now going to start to get in on that act now that we have these expanded disclosure rules. Um, you know, you could think through, say, with MGM in particular, look at these systems were knocked down by a ransomware attack. Okay, but... The business continuity plan, where was that? Because as soon as the automated systems went down, the default was to pull out a pen and a clipboard and wander around the, uh, the hotel lobby in front of that little lion in MGM, taking down people's names and credit card numbers on paper. That's the backup plan. Because if that is a business continuity plan, it's a poor one. So could you argue that MGM had some serious questions about its ability to execute disaster recovery and business continuity? Um, I have had several IT auditors call me up about this and say, if you want to point the finger at anything, point the finger at that. Um, I was more curious, I suppose, about, so MGM had a bunch of systems related to user accounts go down, your automated check-in, your app, your food and beverage, because I'm getting a drink and I just say, bill it to the room. I get it that those have tied to specific user accounts and maybe somebody hacked into it and took down all of those, but they also lost the ATMs and the slot machines and early user systems. You know, anybody can sit down at a slot machine and start pulling on the lever. Anybody can walk in off the street and use an ATM machine. How did those also go down? What was the network design that would let you traverse the user account systems to the other ones? And I get it that slot machines these days have, you know, reward system, scan your room key, they'll track that, okay, now Tom is at this actual slot machine and he's spending this much. Let's give him a comp him on another better room the next time he's here. So maybe there are some expanded security risks there. Well, did anybody think about that? Did it, how is that addressed? And I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, none of us on the outside know the answer to that, but it's an intriguing question that the scope of attack here is astonishing. Every major system that MGM needed pretty much went down. Um, so how did that happen? And then Tom, my third point is on this actually did happen because an attacker, several of them are now claiming responsibility for this. We don't know who, but so far, all of them seem to be saying, we looked up MGM employees on LinkedIn. We found ones who worked in the IT department. We social engineered questions to ask and key data from those user profiles, called up the help desk, pretending to be that employee, and duped the help desk into giving us the credentials we needed to launch the attack. How did that happen? How did the challenge and authentication process for the help desk, how did that break down? because that also sounds like that could be a qualitatively material risk. So do we know what those procedures are? Do we know why they didn't work? Um, you know, but if they use that to get in the system and did no damage, that still is a qualitatively material risk because they could have broken in that way to do extensive damage, which is what they did. 
So it doesn't really matter that they did cause a lot of damage or if you didn't cause a lot of damage, if you can dupe the help desk to get into a position to cause so much damage, that sounds like a qualitatively material risk to me. So you'd have to disclose it. And like we can dance around these issues probably for the rest of the week. But now that we have to disclose these things, if you're a company suffering these cybersecurity incidents, you're going to have to answer all of those questions I just asked. So we've uh, you've identified rather the uh, how the breach occurred, excuse me, how the breach initially, uh, the information which allowed the hackers to get into the system may have come their way, the business resiliency, and then the non-silo nature of the systems from the compliance perspective, after we've done a root cause analysis, how do we move to try to remediate? Is it additional training with the help desk? Is it uh, creating greater silos uh, for information and even having uh, perhaps uh, locked away in a storage room, an old slide card, credit card reader that you can uh, put some carbon paper in and uh, get a number uh, if you have to go in that direction rather than writing it down on a piece of paper. Yeah, no kidding. You're going to have to look on eBay compliance officers, try and find one of those machines. Um, but I think that compliance officers, they, they play one role with several other people trying to straighten out this sort of a situation um, that they will need to be able to sit down with others, particularly around the cybersecurity team and the internal audit team or an IT audit team. If you are that large, you have a dedicated IT audit team sit down and say, you know, what are we doing here? Because there are all sorts of enforcement risks that I, the compliance officer, will have to try and clean up along with legal on the back end of this that we would prefer not to do. So you, cybersecurity team, IT audit team, and when it's your job to figure out what these risks are and develop controls and policies to prevent them, you on the front side, are you fully aware of what's going on? And let's all sit together and try and figure out how to make sure that this entire process from the front end to the back end is as pain-free as possible. That's the sort of thing that compliance officers will have to think about. Um, I know we are primarily talking to compliance officers on this podcast. I would say internal auditors, if you are listening, um, and I hope you are because our podcast is awesome, uh, you guys have a lot to think about with this MGM case because there are so many glaring questions about how did this happen that MGM either didn't know these risks were happening or they thought they had controls in place to prevent it and those controls did not work. Either one of those scenarios is highly relevant to an internal auditor. That is your job, is to look around for enterprise risks and test controls to see if they are working to prevent those risks. One or the other of those things did not happen with MGM. So, you know, do we have a control environment problem where senior management and the board didn't think that this was an issue? Did they believe that it was handled, but they were incorrect? How did this all happen? Tom, just to bring it back to your point, what should compliance officers at other businesses take away from all of this? Uh, take away that the regulatory demands for expanded disclosure, and we're talking about the SEC, but we should remember I already rattled off the Federal Trade Commission, and there are many other regulators out there who expect certain responses in the event of a big cyber attack. You know, you have a lot that you're going to have to think about, and this it drives up the importance of working very closely with cybersecurity and the IT audit team or the internal audit team to figure out what your actual exposure is. I'm willing to bet... I have no in insight into MGM more than what we've all read in the papers. I'm willing to bet MGM thought its cybersecurity was pretty good. I'm willing to bet that they worried about a big cyber attack night and day, and yet this still happened. So how did it happen? How did they get reduced to paper and pencil as a business continuity and disaster recovery plan while they're still struggling a week out to get fully back up to speed? Um, and then ultimately, this is going to have to be discussed in the 10K, in the 10Q. You know it's going to result in, I expect, multiple regulatory investigations, at least. Probably Lena Khan, since she's at MGM anyways. And what else does she have to do with her time if she gets locked out of her room? So, you know, I mean, there's going to be investigations from them. There's going to be investigations from the SEC. There will be shareholder lawsuits and there'll be more. Um, 
And Tom, you know, we're talking about MGM at the same time. We could point out Caesar's Palace down the street. They had a ransomware attack last week at the same time where they paid off the ransom and they stayed open. I can't say I love that implication that maybe giving the criminals what they want and letting the terrorists win is the best strategy, but they did. Uh, and I just saw this afternoon that Clorox has also disclosed that it had suffered a ransomware attack that disrupted operations to the extent that it, it will alter their projected financial performance for the quarter. I'm not really sure about how much, but you know there have been others that we've seen where ransomware attacks disrupt them so much they're not going to make their quote, sales goals, and then they are suddenly having to file these disclosures. And this is only a foretaste of what is coming. And I've also wondered what additional regulatory bodies might look at this. Um, MGM is a U.S. public company, but it also is in many ways a regulated industry because of the money laundering issues. And uh, my first thought was uh, uh, the Nevada Gaming Commission, maybe similar to the New York State Department of Financial Services. Uh, They might be one, but other money laundering um, agencies concerned with money laundering may be um, want to take a look at this as well. They might indeed. Uh, from from I, I don't know that industry, but my impression has always been that gambling, the one thing that they are good at are cash controls. So I do wonder if uh, they at least have the ability to identify vicious transactions. I don't necessarily know how often casinos file those reports. Uh, I think any number of state attorneys general will be curious about this from a privacy breach perspective. Sure, they did steal customer data or did they just decide to, you know, roast MGM over the coals and disrupt every single operating system they had. Um, But possibly there are going to be data breach implications and various states might get in on this. Um, I would die of shock if the Federal Trade Commission does not look at this quite seriously. I have seen similar fact patterns from other companies suffering much breaches, data breaches, not operational disruptions that have resulted in Federal Trade Commission enforcement actions. So what we don't really know right now, two things. Number one was a lot of personal data stolen. Uh, Number two, I'm still not sure how did this actually happen. I guess it's unauthorized credentials. The hackers are saying, I'm not sure that's true. I'd be curious to know if they had already hacked into MGM in other ways and were kind of waiting. And maybe the ATMs and the slots on one day and then the other stay and launched a coordinated sequence. The uh, mechanics of this attack would be fascinating. I'll dive. Jam actually shares that to any extensive amount because they probably just want to so others won't target MGM after this, which is a shame because I bet the postmortem for this would be fascinating to read. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of regulators who look at this extensively. It's a jolt to the system. Anytime you see a big business that is basically paralyzed, in this instance, it's gaming. That's not the end of the world to everybody else. But what if it was a hospital system? What if it was a water filtration company? It was a public utility. Um, you know, you put losses and suddenly lives are on the line and that asterisk. So I think big jolt uh, call for all sorts of businesses. You think Danny Ocean is watching? The remake of Danny Ocean's 11 is going to be lit. So I am there for that movie whenever it comes out. Well, Matt, on that note, uh, I can't wait to see what next week brings us. Thanks, Tom.